Hello my loves, welcome back to another video. I'm Ashley and today I'm going to be doing my February TBR. No, I'm not. <laughs> that video is already up. What I'm going to be doing today is my January wrap up. Wow. Can you tell that I'm already over January? January was a really strange month because so much happened and for once it actually felt like January just flew by for me. That was fun but I managed to read five books and I DNF'd one. <laughs> I've already got a DNF in January. Cool. <laughs> but I'm sure you know how a wrap up works so let's just jump right in. The first one I'm going to mention is the ebook that I read purely because I will forget about it if I don't mention it now. And that is The Power of Hades. This one is a fantasy romance book. It's a Greek myth retelling. You guys know I love my Greek myth retellings. So this one, as you can probably tell from the title, is a retelling of Hades and Persephone. So this one is more of an urban fantasy. And when we start off, Persephone is living in New York, going about her life until Zeus comes along, kidnaps her and basically forces her to take part in the Hades trials, which is a set of trials set in place so that Hades can find his new wife. Now, when she's brought to the underworld to take part in these trials, everybody is shocked because they know that Persephone was already married to Hades and something's happened to mean that most people forget her existence in the underworld. She can't remember anything about it, but everybody does seem to keep alluding to this event that happened and she's got no idea. So Persephone is forced to take part in these trials and this book covers three of nine trials. I didn't actually know that going in. I thought that we would see a kind of wrap up to the trial aspect but we do finish only part way through which is understandable because this book is only about 200 pages long it's not long at all and I will also say if you're going into this specifically looking for romance there are only hints of it I was going in expecting like all-out smut <laughs> it's not the case I had a revelation that me reading lots of smaller fantasy romance books expecting emphasis on the fantasy romance part it's just not working. So I need to reevaluate my entire expectation formula when it comes to reading a fantasy romance books. But in terms of actual plot line and what happens within this book, I really, really enjoyed it. Like I said, there is a mystery aspect to it in which you don't know the past and everybody's trying to avoid her questions when she's asking. So all the way through, I'm just thinking, I really want to know what's happened. How did they break up? Why did they just completely wipe her from existence? I need to know. So that was definitely a key driving force throughout this book. I also just really liked seeing the interpretation of the gods because like I said Persephone started out in New York and she actually kept her love for gardening and things and she was going to set up her own gardening business of some sort and I just love references like that and it definitely worked within this book and when it came to the trials her abilities or her skills when it came to completing the trials were very much based on that kind of reference to the original mythology so I really liked seeing that I really enjoyed the actual plot line of it and all the characters involved it was funny which I didn't expect there was <laughs> one particular character who has something to do with Dionysus and if you know from mythology what any of his kind of his followers shall we say are like then <laughs> you'll get a hint to what kind of character this person would be but they just proved to be hilarious and it was something that I wasn't expecting so I ended up really really enjoying it. I would have liked there to be a little bit more romance but I can definitely tell that we are building up to something and I am very motivated to actually continue the series so hopefully I will do so soon. I do have the next book ready to go on my Kindle so fingers crossed I will get to that but I rated this one at four out of five stars. Next up we have Otherwise by Nicoletta Arbia. This one is again Greek myth retelling but this one is a poetry collection and was actually sent to me by the author so thank you so much for that one. On the front this says five myths of transformation retold in verse through the voices of women and that's pretty much exactly what this does. So throughout this poetry collection we do follow five different women. We have Persephone, Eurydice, Ariadne, Cassandra and Psyche. So I really enjoyed that because I feel like quite often when it comes to these new retellings of Greek mythology being retold through the women's perspective. There are certain characters within mythology which are automatically drawn up more often than others, such as Penelope. Persephone is also quite a popular one, so I like the fact that we have some of those, but then there are also other characters who aren't necessarily spoken about as often. Now with this one, I will openly say that I am not a massive poetry fan. In terms of the form, I really struggle to get along with poetry because I'm just like, why? <laughs> so I was a bit dubious going into this one but I did want to give it a go because it is Greek myth retellings and I'm always looking for more and I did enjoy it. It definitely wasn't overwhelming. I could tell what was going on and one really helpful thing actually is that at the beginning of each section 
you do get a kind of synopsis of the actual story before you go into the poem, which definitely puts the poetry into context and just makes it make sense. There's so many poems which are just full of flowery metaphors and deeper meanings which just don't actually feel like they mean anything. This was actually really quite accessible and I do think that a lot of people would enjoy this. There was one in particular, I think it was the Ariadne one, in which I was a bit confused about which perspective we would follow because these poems do tend to come in sections because they are telling a story. So it's almost like the poems had chapters within itself. But with the Ariadne one, there were certain points where I just didn't understand which character we were following, which felt really bizarre because I understood what was happening in the story and yet I couldn't place who was doing what. So I was like, how can I not know? <laughs> and there were a few times where I had to wait for somebody to refer to somebody else by their name so that I could understand where I was in the story, but it did only happen with that one. Don't know what that's about, but yes, I generally did enjoy this one. Like I said, I was a bit hesitant going into it and I would have been very surprised if I absolutely adored it, but what I will say is that I rated this one either 3.5 or 4 stars. I still haven't decided on a final rating yet because to me it's 3.5 stars but I know that a lot of that rating is me not liking poetry in general so it would be more difficult to impress me but generally the Greek myth aspect of it definitely did keep my attention and I do feel like it was a really interesting contribution to this whole idea of retelling mythology through the women's perspective. I do think it's well worth picking it up if you're interested. So yes we have 3.5 slash 4 stars for this one. Next up we have a reread of A Court of Wings and Ruin by Sarah J Mars. This is the last book in the A Court of Thorns and Roses series and I reread this one because I was doing a live show for Akhtar Long towards the beginning of January so I definitely had to squeeze this in towards the beginning of the month because I hadn't read it since it came out which was a very long time ago and it just felt so comforting even though there's literal like destruction within this book being back with the characters and back with the world is just so comforting because this is definitely a nostalgic read for me. I've loved this series for so long, I've loved the characters for so long, that just delving back into this book and seeing how I came to love them, seeing all of the tiny bits and details from dialogue, from actions throughout the story, and thinking this is what made me love all of the characters, was just a really lovely experience. And then again, Going through the story itself, there was so much that I forgot and it really was as if my brain was just like, this is why I love this book. It just made me remember everything that I adored about it. Now I'm not saying this book is perfect by any means of the word. I do definitely think that there are certain aspects of the story which are very convenient. A lot of people say that about the ending and I definitely agree with that, especially with one character in particular. Actually no, make it two. I'm not going to say which ones because spoilers, clearly, but I do think that the ending could have been pushed just a little bit further in that aspect, but generally I just fell in love with the story all over again. I really cannot say too much because one, spoilers, and two, I've already loved this series for so long that I'm just like, ah! <laughs> But I will say that I'm really, really glad to have had the motivation and the reason to read it before the next book comes out because like I said, there was so much that I forgot about and I definitely feel like I'm going to go into A Court of Silver Flames when that comes out this month much more prepared because I remember all of the ties to the series which I probably would have forgotten over the years. So really enjoyed this one. I think I read like 300 pages in one day which considering I've been on an average of about 30 pages a day for the past four or five months now, that's quite impressive. So as always, Sarah J Maas was writing. I find it really addictive. I find it really fast paced and I loved it. So five out of five stars from me. Next up we have Of Goblins and Gold by Emma Hamm. This one again is a fantasy romance book, independently published and you might have seen that I will actually be doing an interview with Emma Hamm towards the end of this month on the 21st of February. I'll leave a link to that down in the description box so that you can set a reminder if you want one. And that event is in affiliation with Pharaoh Feb and so because of that I did want to read a few Emma Hamm books but I have been meaning to read her books for the longest time so this definitely was just one massive push to do so. This is her most recent book and the reason why I read this one is because it's probably the one that we're most likely to reference within the live show event however there's not going to be any spoilers or anything so if you do want to turn up to the event hear just generally about her books and whatnot then you can come to that. But either way I did want to read it and I'm so glad I did because I really really enjoyed it. So again this one is a really short one and again like with Power of Hades this is why I had the revelation about changing my expectations going into short fantasy romance books because the romance aspect of it is there 
and you do definitely get hints of it, you get the beginnings of a story, but it's definitely not like smutty or anything like that. If you're looking for a fantasy romance that's just straight up smut, this is not it. But what it is, is a really interesting story about a girl who is trying to save her sister from the Goblin King because he has kidnapped her. So she goes into the Goblin Realms, the Fairy Realms, and the Goblin King puts her through a series of trials. I seem to be reading a lot of things about trials recently, but a big thing with the Goblin King in this book is that he very much likes playing games and being trickstery. It has the typical fairy trope in which he can't lie, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to try and hide the truth. I love that trope so much. It's one of my favourite things, especially when it's in the situation where there's some kind of game or competition involved because you know that they're going to try and sabotage that so it's just a case of trying to anticipate everybody's next move but also trying to stay ahead of the game and also throughout these different trials that she has to do we get to visit multiple different types of fairy courts different types of creatures so we have fairies elves goblins things like that and I just love doing this kind of tour of that world because it was just really fascinating to see the world building. I will say there are certain elements which I think the book would have benefited from had they been explained a little bit more so if the book was a bit longer and we experience more of what the character was experiencing because the example I used in one of my vlogs when I was reading this is that there's a certain scenario in which a character and again I'm going to say this as vague as possible so I don't ruin anything but one of the characters comes across the history of another character. They read it and they come to the conclusion that this person is actually really kind. We learn that in about as many words as I've just said we don't actually learn and read the history of said character ourselves we don't get that story, we just get a vague reference to really awful times in the past, some kind of war, and then we get the first character just reiterating the fact that they now think differently of this other one. So I think that would have definitely benefited from us actually seeing the history for ourselves and coming to that conclusion ourselves rather than being told it. However, I do think that it was a really fast paced and again, an addictive book. And I will definitely be reading more Emma Ham books throughout February, so do keep an eye out for that. But I rated this one at four out of five stars. So then the last book which I finished in its entirety was Master of Sorrows by Justin T. Cole. The author did send this my way, so thank you very much for that one. And I am so glad that we ended up in contact with each other because I ended up loving this book. I always find this one a little bit difficult to describe because there's just so much to it. In the most basic terms, in this one we are based in a school, in an academy, which trains its students to find magical artifacts and bring them back because they're very much seen as a bad thing and they need confiscating and kind of locked away so that nobody can come across them and use them. In this world magic is very much seen as a bad thing, it's associated with this very like chaotic god and we follow a boy called Anev who is training to become one of these students who goes out to collect the magical artifacts to become a master and so in the beginning of this book he is training to go through this kind of competition to gain that title. Now the reason why it gets more complicated is because Anev is actually missing one of his hands and part of his arm. So he actually has this kind of magical prosthetic so that nobody knows about this because in this world having any kind of disability or mark against your body is definitely not a good thing. So a big content warning for ableism because that is just prevalent throughout this in this world building. But he's hiding the fact that he's literally missing one of his limbs because he would just not be accepted at all. And through hiding it, he's using magic which he's been trained into seeing as a bad thing. Now at the beginning we do know that he has this mentor who trains him in magic and teaches him about it and his stance is that magic isn't an inherently bad thing, it just depends on how you use it. So Anev is very much stuck between two different ideologies of magic is bad versus magic is sometimes good and while he's training under this ideology of magic is bad, he's very much living the opposite existence. So there's a lot of contradicting information throughout this book. But the very basis of that, if that sounds complicated, just amplify it even more because we have a really intricate mythology tied in with the fantasy of this world. And when you first start reading, you actually start on like chapter three or something because you have a prologue and then you have this kind of mythological recounting and then you go into the story because the mythology of this world feels so authentic. You can definitely see the inspirations pulled from real life mythologies and it really does feel completely plausible why the society in this book is the way it is based on the mythology and the religion that its society is constructed through. We then also have the entire atmosphere and the situation surrounding the academy itself and the students within it. Any rivalries that go down, the relationships between him and his friends, you know, keeping secrets while also wanting to compete against them and oh my god there's just so much to this book which I could just be like ah! <laughs> 
A few small things to point out is that the main character, I said this in my vlog as well, and it's just something that I find really interesting, but we do see the main character cry, and it's not seen as like a diminishing weakness of any kind. It just really emphasised the fact that he's getting so many conflicting things thrown at him, and his frustration of not knowing where he stands, not knowing how to exist, because his entire existence is just being called into question, and you really do feel that frustration. And so it's completely understandable when he starts crying at points, and I just found it really interesting to see, and really nice to see, because it's so rare that you see people crying in books, <laughs> especially fantasy books, and I'm like, you have a lot going on, I would be crying too. I really enjoyed every single second of this book. The ending? I was not expecting the ending to go the way it did and I'm still genuinely a little bit shook because I'm like, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> so I absolutely need the second book as soon as possible, which I believe is coming out in May, so hopefully don't have to wait too long, but oh my goodness, just I could rave about this book for days, I really could. The audiobook as well is incredible, it's probably one of the best audiobooks I've ever listened to, so if you're looking for a new audiobook, this one. <laughs> so when I initially rated this, I rated it 4.5 out of 5 stars, but the more I think on it, I might actually rate it 5 stars because it's just, it's one of those that I keep thinking about and I really cannot think of a fault, so possibly a new favourite. Possibly a new favourite. Super glad I read this one, highly recommend. So then we have the two books which I didn't finish in January, one because I decided not to and one because I'm slow. So the first DNF of 2021 is Secrets of the Starcross by Clara O'Connor, which is so ironic <laughs> because I've mentioned this in so many videos, hyping it up and saying that I think I'm going to absolutely adore it. And I didn't, I DNF'd it, I just, I got 230 pages in. So I got over halfway through this book, but I just really wasn't fancying it. This was the very first book I picked up of 2021, and we got to January 30th, and I was still reading it. So this book is one big mashup of many different inspirations, because on the back this one says, two star-crossed lovers fight to ignite the spark of rebellion. What if the Roman Empire never fell? What if Caesar still ruled London? What if the Celtic throne still stood beyond its walls? What if their ancient elemental power still thrummed through the ley lines woven deep within the land, within earth, air and water? What if someone or something unleashed it? Now, I read that and was just like, oh my god, this is going to be incredible, it's got so many inspirations that I love, but that ultimately ended up being its downfall for me because I really struggled with the world building. This book is actually really easy to read, however, when it came to the history of the world specifically, I just could not for the life of me retain the information because we would have so many inspirations, we would have references to the Tudor dynasty, we would have Roman history, we would have Celtic folklore, we would have so many inspirations that I knew as separate things that it made me realise that I would have taken a lot of convincing to mash all of those inspirations into one world because to me they're very separate things, in this they're not and so it meant that every so often we would get huge instances of dialogue which would basically be the characters trying to explain some kind of family lineage and how the history surrounding them influence society today and how people are, you know, associated with either good or bad things and I just, I couldn't retain the information. I would read these big paragraphs and be like, why are you telling me this? Is this important? Do I need to know this? And I wanted to, and usually I'm really good at just picking up on fantasy world building. I expect to be confused for at least the first 100 pages of any fantasy book, but it just kept happening. I just lost interest because I'm like, I don't understand why it's so big of a problem. I understood on a basic sense of like, this person versus this person clashed at some point in history and so society is the way it is today. But in terms of when the characters would go into, like I said, their family lineage, I just didn't understand why it kept being brought up. And that's the thing because the basic sense of the conflict was already laid out from the very beginning. So the fact that it kept being brought in, but with even more details, is what made me question whether it was actually needed and whether I actually needed to pay attention to what I was reading because I just, I didn't, I... <laughs> I don't know. As well as that, I didn't find myself invested in the character stories. There was very much this cycle going around in terms of the relationships between the main characters in which they would just flop back and forth between the same thing. And with the main character specifically, she would cycle through the same thoughts and emotions constantly, which is understandable because that's how things work, but also 
I've read 230 pages and nothing to actually progress that far from the first like 100. It's been the same sort of thing and I just didn't really feel like I was getting anywhere and I really did not have the attention that would have been needed to actually finish the book and I do feel bad about it because I really wanted to enjoy it and I don't think it's awful. It's just not what I expected, it's not for me. I needed it to be pieced together a little bit more coherently for me to be like okay I'm on board with this and as we were approaching the end of the month I kept thinking I really should finish this book which then made me not want to read because I didn't want to read this book. I kept straying towards other books, I put it down for like half the month without even thinking about it so yes we got to a point in which I was just like I think I need to give up. <laughs> So I did, um, but I will say that I think a lot of people would enjoy this book because it is really accessible and it is interesting seeing the different inspirations and how they are attempted to link together. And I think even just in general, the kind of rebellion storyline is something that could be really addictive, especially because we do have this crossover between fantasy and sci-fi. You know, we're based in a society which has so many different technical advancements and I actually really love the beginning of this because we see a court case happen or multiple court cases happen but with advanced technology in which people would vote in a kind of similar way but you know it was a different take on jury duty basically and I found that sort of thing really interesting and I kind of wish that we saw more of that because as we pulled away from that that's when I lost my interest so yes I do think this would be a good one for many people but for me not so much so I DNF this one. So then the book which I'm still currently reading and so have pulled into February is Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer. This one was pulled out of my TBR Patreon jar as part of my book buying ban negotiation challenge. So this one was submitted by Nicole and I'm very very glad for that because I am enjoying this one so much. This one is a kind of dystopian sci-fi, more dystopian I would guess, but it's based on a place called Area X, which is just an environmental disaster zone. They don't know what's happened there, and so they keep sending out expeditions of people to this area to try and find out what happens. However, every single time an expedition is sent out, something drastically wrong happens, whether it be mass suicide, whether it be them all turning guns on each other, whether it's an epidemic of some sort, they just don't come out of it, basically. So in this book, we're following the 12th expedition and what they discover while they're there. Jeff Vandermeer is known for writing very strange stories, and it definitely Definitely is the case happening in here but I am so fascinated I just want to know what the hell is going on there are some elements in the story which I haven't read too much of in other stories so I'm finding those really fascinating but as well this is kind of presented as if it's a journal of some sort a scientific log of their discoveries and so you kind of know that this is from one perspective one very specific perspective even the narrator themselves is just kind of like I know I'm being influenced by this thing and that makes it so interesting because it's just like you cannot really trust what they're saying they don't know what's going on we don't know what's going on it's all just strange it really is interesting to see especially when you do consider it as a scientific log of some sort because then you can start looking into what sort of information they're including what they're not and it's just building to be this really intriguing story of just it's like a scientific mystery it really is so really enjoying this one so far. You will probably be seeing this in my next vlog on Monday or otherwise in my February wrap up. So yeah. Oh and Jade also gifted this one to me so thank you so much for that Jade. So this lovely little lot and the power of Hades is the summary of my January wrap up. Not too bad, not too bad. I would like to read a little bit more if I can in February but we had some good reads throughout the month so I'm happy with that much at least. So with that I will just finish up this video here. As always let me know if you've read any of the books I've just mentioned and what your thoughts on them were if you have and also let me know what your favourite book of January was. But for now I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did then remember to leave a like and a comment so let me know that you're here. If you're not subscribed already then please consider to doing so down in the description box you'll find information to all the books i've mentioned all of my social media and other bookish stuff as well so be sure to check that out if you haven't already but for now i hope you're having a lovely day and i shall see you next time with a new video bye